remain behind the fame this time, the tragically short life of the Queen of Hearts, the wrecked reputation of a TV funny man, the heartache of the little sparrow, and the private pain of a screen legend. In Hollywood, Roman Polanski's very name is a byword for horror. And it's not just for making such psychologically disturbing films as Repulsion, Rosemary's Baby and Chinatown. Off screen, Roman has experienced real life nightmares, far worse than anything he could put on celluloid. Born in Paris in 1933 to a Polish Jewish father and Russian mother, Roman encountered terror from a very early age, when his family made the fateful decision to return to Poland two years before the start of World War II. Singled out by the Nazis and forced into the Krakow ghetto, the family suffered terribly. Roman's mother died in Auschwitz, but her fate remained unknown to him until after the war. It is hardly surprising that his early films were bleak studies in oppression and darkness. Even his first major Hollywood film was 1968's macabre thriller, Rosemary's Baby. But it was the real life events of the following year that horrified not only Roman, but the entire world. On the evening of the 9th of August, 1969, Roman's young wife, Sharon Tate, who was eight and a half months pregnant with their child, was murdered in their home on Cello Drive in Hollywood's Benedict Canyon. She was stabbed 16 times. Four others visiting the property that night also died. Roman was still working on a film in England, but he returned immediately on hearing of the murders. It eventually transpired that the killers were members of Charles Manson's so-called family. They had been ordered by Manson to go to the house and kill everyone inside it, although it remains unclear whether the intended victims were previous residents Terry Melcher and his then-girlfriend Candace Bergen, as Melcher had angered Manson by refusing to record some of his music. Roman was understandably devastated by Sharon's death, and the ramifications of those events are still being felt today. As recently as 2004, he successfully sued Vanity Fair magazine for suggesting that he had sexually propositioned a young Swedish model on the way to Sharon's funeral. Following his admission of unlawful sexual intercourse with a 13-year-old girl in 1978, Roman gave his evidence by video link for fear of extradition to the US. Having fled the country before he could be imprisoned, Roman has lived ever since in France, unable to return even to accept his Best Director Oscar for The Pianist in 2002. Basketball superstar Kobe Bryant is the first shooting guard in National Basketball Association history to be drafted out of high school. He and teammate Shaquille O'Neal led the LA Lakers to three consecutive championships from 2000 to 2002. But in 2003, all the attention was focused on his less than impressive off-court action. Just a few months after his wife of two years, Vanessa, had given birth to their first child, Natalie, the Lakers legend was accused of raping a young woman from Colorado. During police investigations, Kobe allegedly landed Shaquille O'Neal in it by saying he should have followed his former teammate's example and paid the woman not to say anything. He then claimed Shaquille had already shelled out up to a million dollars for situations like these. In court, he insisted that this sexual encounter with the 19-year-old had been consensual, but to the media, he said nothing. I don't know, I'm not really here to talk about hearings. Anybody got any questions about the season and my teammates would be more than happy to answer those. With sales of replica Kobe Bryant jerseys plummeting, he just wanted it all to go away. I just take it a day at a time. I mean, I don't think about it too much. I come here and I work. This is my job, and I, you know, I work extremely hard at it. He even tried to put a positive spin on it. Well, has it not going through something like this humbles you. Uh, and you understand that uh, the, the ultimate purpose here is to uh, do God's work. Assuming, of course, that God supports the LA Lakers, in which case he'd probably take the same stand as this fan. I think, unfortunately, Kobe did it. He's going down. 
Lakers are going to win anyway, though. And really, that's all that's important, I think. You know, whether Kobe or not did it is really beside the point. You know, the, the, the fact that the girl is saying all this, you know, she's just trying to get publicity. But, you know, basically, I don't care. In the end, charges were dropped when Kobe agreed to apologize to the victim. Details of the accompanying financial compensation were not made public. As one of the four core members of the worldwide hit sitcom Seinfeld, Michael Richards was one of the most recognizable faces on the planet throughout the 1990s. Alongside the eponymous Jerry Seinfeld, Jason Alexander as George, and Julia Louis-Dreyfus as Elaine, Michael starred as Seinfeld's eccentric neighbor, Cosmo Kramer. After Seinfeld, he co-wrote, co-executive produced, and starred in The Michael Richards Show as an inept private eye. The show was met by negative reviews and audience indifference. It was cancelled after only a few weeks. But things were about to get much worse for Michael. Returning to stand-up after the failure of his own TV show, in November 2006 he was performing at the Laugh Factory in West Hollywood when he got into a heckling match with some latecomers and began racially abusing them. The entire incident was filmed on a punter's camera phone and Michael felt the full weight of widespread condemnation for his outburst. He made a comment that 50 years ago, African Americans would have been hanging from a tree with a fork stuck up their rear end. And 50 years later, we're saying to Mr. Richards that that's unacceptable hate speech and that that type of rhetoric was caused many blacks to be hanged and lynched because of intolerance. And certainly it's unacceptable and we are calling for him to make an immediate apology, and we're giving him 24 hours to make this apology. Uh, we will have some upcoming demonstrations and protests against Mr. Richards. He claimed that anger was the culprit and that he isn't inherently racist, appearing on various talk shows and with the likes of Jesse Jackson to apologize for his behavior. I'm sorry. I'm very, very sorry to the African-American community for, um, for the upset. Uh, and as a performance artist, uh, in the course of what comes through in the motion of my work, uh, I can say that I'm happy this has all come about because it's out in the open and uh, I've been a conduit to something that I think is quite uh, meaningful. Uh, and the work begins outside, and the work begins inside. Uh, bless you. He claimed he had tried to defuse the heckling by being outrageous. In July 2007, however, Michael announced he had retired from stand-up comedy in order to spiritually heal and to travel to Cambodia with his fiancée, Beth Skip. Coming up, our tragic love affair with a princess. On the 31st of August 1997, ordinary people the world over were shocked by their own reactions to the news that Diana, Princess of Wales, had been killed in a car crash in Paris. Ever present on magazine covers and news broadcasts, Diana's face had become as familiar to the developed world as a family member or a friend. Without realizing how much she'd come to mean to us, we were suddenly faced with the prospect of never seeing her again. The world could not quite come to terms with the fact that after 17 years, the tempestuous affair was over. At the age of 36, the Queen of Hearts was gone forever. Is it any Back in 1980, the relationship got off to a tentative start with a shy smile and a nervous wave as Lady Diana Spencer took her first baby steps as a paparazzi magnet. While working as a nanny and sharing a flat with friends in London, she started dating the heir to the throne and was relentlessly hounded by the press. The announcement that everyone was waiting for came in February 1981. But although the British public had already lost its heart to the shy and sensitive teenager, when asked how he felt about the engagement, her fiancé was rather evasive. 
While Diana was clearly stung by his lack of effusiveness, she pressed on with her preparations for their big day. On July 29, 1981, less than a year after first coming to the public's attention, people were chanting her name in the streets. The nation was given the day off and crowds lined the streets up to St Paul's Cathedral to catch a glimpse of the fairy tale princess. It was the same story as they pulled up to the royal yacht Britannia, and Princess Diana was all smiles as she and Charles set off on their honeymoon. In the following months and years, she began to eclipse the rest of the royal family in the affections of the public. She was an overdue antidote to the traditional stiff upper lips and guarded reserve. She had a smile for everyone. In 1987, when AIDS patients were being demonized by the press, Diana was holding their hands. HIV does not make people dangerous to know. So you can shake their hands and give them a hug. Heaven knows they need it. Along with all the media proof of her tireless dedication to good causes and charity work, came stories that she also visited the sick in secret, beseeching nurses and patients not to let on to the press. Having earned herself the title of the People's Princess, she went on to win even more hearts as rumors of her personal troubles began to hit the gossip magazines. Towards the late 80s, reports emerged that Charles was carrying on an affair with his old sweetheart, Camilla Parker Bowles. And while there was also much talk of Diana's alleged affairs, many magazines chose to apply the spin that she was merely acting out of loneliness. This line was bolstered by stories about her battles with bulimia and multiple suicide attempts. Her every move was followed by telephoto lenses and media speculation. In an attempt to redress the balance, she approached biographer Andrew Morton to tell her side of the story, depicting Charles as a neglectful and unfaithful husband. After that, it was only a few short months and the odd awkward public appearance before the announcement of a royal separation hit the headlines. In 2003, she continued to use her public profile to raise awareness of issues that had been swept under the carpet by polite society for years. And she wasn't afraid to speak from her own agonizing experience. I have it on very good authority that the quest for perfection our society demands can leave the individual gasping for breath at every turn. This pressure inevitably extends into the way we look. Eating disorders, whether it be anorexia or bulimia, show how an individual can turn the nourishment of the body into a painful attack on themselves. But by the end of the year, having lived so much of her life in the intense glare of the media spotlight, the pressure of public life had clearly become unmanageable. And she made this heartfelt announcement. When I started my public life 12 years ago, I understood the media might be interested in what I did. I realized then their attention would inevitably focus on both our private and public lives. But I was not aware of how overwhelming that attention would become, nor the extent to which it would affect both my public duties and my personal life in a manner that's been hard to bear. At the end of this year, when I've completed my diary of official engagements, I will be reducing the extent of the public life I've led so far. Despite her declarations, the media's obsession with her continued, as did her own obsession with body image. Her increasingly frequent trips to the gym were always accompanied by a gaggle of photographers, desperate to add fuel to one of the many rumors making the rounds about her private life. 
After her separation, the press had linked her with every heterosexual man she came into contact with, from rugby captain Will Carling and singer Brian Adams to Juan Carlos I of Spain and John F. Kennedy Jr. Living in London, estranged from her two sons William and Harry, she reportedly busied herself with trips to the cinema, private charity work, midnight walks through central London, and TV dinners in front of her favorite soap operas. She also hung out with members of the gay glitterati, like Gianni Versace, George Michael, and fellow bulimic Elton John. And while she may have cut down on her public engagements, she certainly didn't abandon those causes that had always been close to her heart. In January 2007, these pictures of her visiting a landmine site in Angola were flashed around the world, bringing much needed publicity to the issue of unexploded landmines in war-torn territories. Seven months later, she went on another visit to meet landmine survivors in Bosnia. For one last time, she managed to turn the relentless media pressure into a positive, exposing the devastating effects of landmines, particularly on children. Just days after the Bosnian trip, she lay dying in a dark tunnel in Paris, surrounded by the rapid-fire click of automatic cameras that had punctuated almost every waking moment of her adult life. Perhaps it was the last sound she heard before slipping out of consciousness. A fitting end for a princess who was literally loved to death. Coming up, the heartache of Edith Piaf. If there is one person who could inspire a whole episode or even an entire series of Pain Behind the Fame, surely it would be Edith Piaf, the singer of such emotionally wrenching classics as Je ne regret rien and La Vie en Rose. One of France's most famous and beloved entertainers, the little sparrow lived a life filled with heartache and tragedy. The pain began with her lowly birth on the streets of Paris in 1915 and ended with her tragically early death from liver cancer. Her mother was a street singer who left her early on to try and make it as a solo performer. At just 17, Edith had a child, Marcel, but the girl died of meningitis just two years later. Things seemed to be looking up when she was discovered by the impresario Louis Le Play, who gave her a contract, changed her name from Gassion to Piaf, and offered her the chance to perform for the upper echelons of French society, who were quickly won over by the raw passion and sincerity of her singing style. But a year later, in 1936, Le Play was murdered by mobsters who were connected with Edith, and she was held for questioning. The negative publicity threatened to derail her burgeoning career, but supporters like Jean Cocteau and Raymond Asso helped her get back on track. She became romantically involved with Asso, along with men like actor Paul Maurice and composer Henri Conté. The love of her life, though, was the boxer Marcel Serdin, who was killed in a plane crash in 1949, sending Edith into depths of despair. This was compounded a couple of years later when she was involved in a car accident with her friend and protégé Charles Aznavour. She broke an arm and a couple of ribs and was left with an ever-increasing dependency on morphine and alcohol. Two more serious car crashes followed and three stints in rehab. But her health was failing fast and her last years were full of pain and trauma. She finally died on the 11th of October 1963. She was just 47, although she looked decades older. The only performer in history to have won four Oscars for Best Actress, Catherine Hepburn is a true icon of 20th century cinema, thanks to films like Bringing Up Baby, The Philadelphia Story, Stage Door, Holiday, The African Queen, The Lion in Winter, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. There was no one quite like her, but even a star as seemingly unassailable as Catherine Hepburn had secret heartaches that punctuated her life and career. 
some of her most famous and best loved films are the sparkling and witty Battle of the Sexes comedies she made with Spencer Tracy, like Adam's Rib, Pat and Mike, and Woman of the Year. The public loved them, and so did the critics. But what audiences didn't know was that for many years she and Spencer were a devoted couple. They could never be open about their relationship because Tracy was a devout Catholic and refused to divorce his wife. In more recent years, biographers have claimed that their relationship was partly a convenient cover for their individual same-sex love affairs. Apart from her private life, Catherine has also had a taste of professional despair. There was a period in the 1930s where she gained the nickname Catherine of Arrogance and witness a string of her films, including Sylvia Scarlet, A Woman Rebels, and Quality Street, flop badly. Oh, that's that is exactly what I mean. And in 1938, she suffered the ultimate indignity of being dubbed box office poison in a motion picture exhibitor poll. The only comfort was that Fred Astaire, Marlena Dietrich, and Joan Crawford were also tarred with the same brush. But instead of retiring to lick her wounds, the indomitable Kate appeared in the Philadelphia story on Broadway, bought the film rights, and continued working almost up to her death, aged 96, staying positive to the end. I've had a wonderful life. I've had a very fortunate life, very lucky. Those of us who knew her well and loved her will miss her terribly. But through her films, Generations to come will discover her humor and grace, her keen intelligence, and her soaring independence. She was and always will be an American original, and she died as she lived with dignity and grace. With an estimated net worth of $358 million and more enterprises than you can poke a stick at, it's perhaps comforting to know that the artist formerly known as Puff Daddy and P. Diddy has also had his fair share of heartache. Life got off to a tragic start for the boy from Mount Vernon near the Bronx. His father, Melvin Coombs, was shot dead in his car at the age of 33, leaving two-year-old Sean John fatherless. Growing up amongst gangsters and hustlers clearly rubbed off, and by 1990, he was flexing his muscle as a hard-nosed party promoter. In 1991, disaster struck when he and partners oversold tickets to a New York concert. The college gymnasium was packed to twice its capacity, and nine people died in the crush. In a court ruling, Diddy was found 50% responsible for the incident. In 1999, he was accused of assaulting Steve Stout of Interscope Records over a blasphemous video featuring rap star Nas. The same year, while out with then fiance Jennifer Lopez, he got into even deeper hot water. After gunfire broke out at a Manhattan nightclub, police arrested Diddy and rapper Shine on weapons violations. He was later indicted after his driver claimed that he had tried to bribe him into taking the weapon after the shooting. At the end of the trial, Diddy walked free, while Shine was convicted and copped a 10-year sentence. Commentators were taking bets on how much he'd been paid to take the fall. In 2004, he settled a $3 million lawsuit with his former driver, who'd claimed he'd suffered emotional damage after the club shooting. Two years later, the Uber entrepreneur was being accused of outsourcing work on his clothes labels to teenage girls doing 14-hour shifts for just 15 cents an hour. It was then announced that department store Macy's had pulled two styles of Sean John's faux fur hooded jackets that turned out to be made from dog fur. Six months later came the announcement that Diddy was splitting from his long-term girlfriend and mother of four of his children, Kim Porter. Most celebrity watchers attributed the rift to a DNA test, which forced Diddy to admit that while Kim had been pregnant with twin daughters, he had fathered another child with a woman called Sarah Chapman.